let's take a moment, center ourselves in that Christ presence. That's our true teacher. And we open up to the Christ within us and hear what you have to tell us. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. All right. In this last uh, Sunday of January, we're blessing the seeds that we planted early in January, those seeds of good. And let's uh, affirm our January statement. We'll align with it three times. And we use affirmations not to make these things true, but because they are true. That's right. We align our minds with them. So here we go. With faith in the Christ in me, I courageously plant seeds of good. Now align with that again and think about uh, what good you want to see in your life and let's affirm it again. With faith in the Christ in me, I courageously plant seeds of good. Align with it again and now with energy and knowing that generative life that is within us, the God life, our spiritual life, let's let it shine and let's align with this the third time. With faith in the Christ in me, I courageously plant seeds of good. All right. And then uh, this week we'll take those seeds of good that we planted and we will send them on to Silent Unity, to the Unity's Prayer Ministry at Unity Village outside of Kansas City, Missouri, and they will hold them in prayer for 30 days. So you know they're getting lots of good prayer, right? You feel them sprouting? Good deal. Before I get into the talk here, I do want to... Um, amplify the invitation that Pastor Martha extended to you. Would you get out your hot pink sheet there and take a look at this. I hope this is a wonderful way to plant and cultivate seeds of good here in our community. You may have noticed that our community here at Unity of Austin is expanding. You see that in energy and consciousness and in numbers. And um, so this year we're going to be doing a series of community building workshops. And uh, we'll be, do three or maybe four, and uh, they'll culminate in the fall with some goal setting for who, as a community, what goals do we want to set to fulfill this beautiful vision and mission that we have of living these Jesus Christ principles. And so there's some wonderful things that we do along the way. These are workshops that I do with churches. I've been doing them for years, and they are wonderful. They're lots of fun, <coughs> and they work. So the first one that we're going to be ta uh, working with in, at the end of February here is communicating with love and creativity activity staying connected when differences make a difference. Have you ever noticed that the more people you have, the more ideas you have? And that's a good thing. And when we build our consciousness and skill in communicating across differences, what we find is that we can use those differences as a way of generating creativity rather than as a reason of butting heads, right? So, um, so this is a lot of fun, complete with a fashion show. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, but um, it's a lot of fun, so I hope you'll take a look at this, and on the back, uh, you can fill it out. You uh, reserve your spot and reserve your manual. Um, there's a cost to the manual, but you can read that. It's pretty minimal, and you can also go in with another person and use one manual together, then it's really manual, minimal. We'll have these in the um, bulletin every Sunday for the next few Sundays. But I uh, hope you'll put it on your calendar, fill it out. You can put it in the offering bag or the ushers or hand it to an usher and the ushers will get it to us in the office. But plan to come. It's a lot of fun. It's a good way to keep our community growing and thriving and to have some laughs and learn some <coughs> skills that you can apply not just here but in your family, in your workplace, and where you play, where you volunteer. So you can think about coming? Yes. Thank you. That was yes. 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 Thank you. Okay. Good deal. Plan to come, not think about it, plan. Okay, all right, so, all right, my story. I gotta tell you a story, right? Okay, here we go. Okay, so there was a couple that was getting ready to go on vacation and they were walking out the door and they had on their vacation clothes, they had their bags packed, they had their camera around their neck and they're walking out the door and one of them turns to the other and says, surely there's something we've forgotten to worry about, right? Have you ever done that? You get everything ready, you get everything packed, you think you've got it all together, but surely there's something I forgot, right? Isn't there something that I could worry about here, wonder about? Well, you know, whether we live life from a point of believing that we are getting the good, that we're participating in the good, or whether we're living life from that point of worrying has to do with how we view life. 
do I see myself as part of the good? Do I see myself as part of um, a universe where life is in harmony and where there is abundance for me? Or do I see myself as cut off from my good? That's an important question, isn't it? That really matters. And so uh, today we're going to be talking about partnering with God because when we begin to open up to the reality that we do live in a universe that is life itself, that is harmony, that is abundance, that is goodness, and that's good with a capital G, then things become different because we begin to partner with that goodness in a conscious way. Um, I'd like to share with you, this is from the Daily Word um, in January, and it's in the beginning of it, it of this month, and it's a, from, it's a letter that was written into Silent Unity from a woman named Betty in Oklahoma, and I'm just going to read a few things. Betty wrote a little poem that she says she's been using for every day for years, and I'll just read a few pieces out of her poem because it really says it. She writes, Wake up every morning with a joyful heart as all your problems have been turned over to the divine from the start. And then she writes, Remember there's a source greater than you, and it's not only for a chosen few. And then this one, I love this one. Do everything in moderation, and you won't mess up your vibration. <laughs> so thank you, Betty, from Oklahoma, who's the Daily Word reader. And that's the truth. R Ralph Waldo Emerson, who's uh, one of the, the, the great uh, speakers and writers, you know, of the 1800s. And, and one of the places where in Unity we got um, a lot of our, our ideas, our Unity is one of... Ralph Waldo Emerson is one of the thought streams from which we got our unity ideas. And he wrote it, he said it this way, a little more formally, but the same thing that Betty's saying. He says, a little consideration of what takes place around us every day would show us that a higher law than that of our will regulates events, that our painful labors are very unnecessary and altogether fruitless. Belief and love will relieve us of a vast load of care. Oh, my brothers, God exists. And I've got to tell you this, I just can't resist. It's just been on my mind. Yesterday I went to see at the Bullock Museum the uh, documentary uh, movie Dark Universe. Have any of you seen it? Well, it's only going to be there a few more days, so you've got to run down there and see it. You have to go, go at 10 o'clock in the morning. But um, it's wonderful. It's uh, about the universe. It's narrated by Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, who's the great astrophysicist, and uh, does such a great job of translating all of that for the normal person here, by me. And um, it's a beautiful documentary about the universe, and, and uh, one of the most things that impressed me the most was that uh, what scientists think at this point is that of, of the, all the universe that, that scientists can perceive, you know, with all of their instrumentation, 5% of it is matter that is perceivable. Only 5%. I think it's about uh, the other... 95% of it, of that, about 90%, um, this part I can't remember the exact amount, but about 90% of it is what they call dark energy, which means it's energy that uh, cannot be detected by any instrumentation, and the other, about 5%, is what they call dark matter, which is dark matter which can't be perceived. And how do they know this? Basically because they can tell about the way things are, the way what we do perceive, uh, how it works, how it is arranged, and how it moves in the universe. So my takeaway from that is there's a whole lot we don't know. A whole lot. And it's good because look what it generates. It generates this earth that we're sitting on. It generates us. It generates all this vastness um, of the perceivable universe. And there's so much of it that we don't know. So much that is generative from which what we see comes. And that's really the thought stream that we have in unity, isn't it? We know that. And I, you know, I'm always a little hesitant to equate exactly what the scientists say with spirituality because uh, there's not exactly that direct uh, correlation. But the idea, the concept is absolutely correlated. That what we know is that what we see comes from what we can't perceive. What we feel and touch and taste with our five senses comes not out of nowhere, it comes out of a level of life, a level of generativity, a life of energy um, that we cannot perceive with our five senses. That's wonderful. That's good news. Because it's not just true on this incredible cosmic scale. It's true in your life. It's true in my life. 
So if I want to live my life in a way that is moving forward, in a way in which I'm growing, in a way in which I'm constructing and creating good, what it helps me is to be aware that my true life, the true seed is within me in what I cannot see. And as human beings, how we perceive that is that we go into the silence, that we dwell in that place where we experience that presence of God. You know, in the Bible it's talked about as the still, small voice. Um, and, and with our thoughts, in human beings, our thoughts are what is the creative part of the creative process. We go into that divine mind, into that place that is not perceivable by senses, and yet with our thoughts, we begin to let that form, and it moves out into our thoughts, out into our attitudes, out into our emotions, out into our actions, and that, my friends, is how we create what is in our lives. That's a miracle. Isn't that amazing? And so the message for us, the message to me that I keep getting over and over is partner with God, partner with God, partner with that, which I, we call it God, you can call it whatever you want to, it doesn't matter. You can call it the dark universe, whatever you want to call it. It's that which you can't see, which you can't perceive, but it is life itself, is that we partner with it and then that is how we grow, that is how we experience. So how do we do that? It's pretty simple. We simply say yes. We say yes to it. Because the only thing that can slow us down in generating good is when we close off our awareness to that life force. It never stops it entirely or we would just vanish. We can't stop it entirely. I think that's good news, right? That's grace, all right? And yet we can sure slow it down by turning away from it, turning away from it, shutting our minds off of it. And so the invitation to us always is to turn our minds back to the good, turn our minds back to life, turn our minds back to God. And that in that way, we partner with the good, we partner with God. I want to tell you a story that comes out of the Bible, that comes from um, the Hebrew Bible or Christianity. We call that the Old Testament. And it's a story about what happened in uh, the days of Nehemiah and, and before. Um, at one point in the, in the history of the, the kingdom of Israel and Judah, um, they were conquered by the Assyrians. And when the Assyrians came in and conquered the kingdom of Judah, they uh, took off a lot of the people that lived in Judah and they took them back to Babylon to live there and to work there and to uh, serve in the government and serve lots of different posts there in Babylon. And they left the rest of the people they left back in Judah. And this went on for quite a, a long time. And you can imagine that the people in, that were left in Judah were in quite a lot of despair. They were in disarray. Their, you know, their way of life had been disrupted. A lot of the people had been taken away. They, kind, they got discouraged and they fell away from God and they fell away from worshiping God how they had used to do. They fell away from that understanding that they were in partnership with God. So meanwhile... Let's get to Nehemiah, and this is in the book of Nehemiah, if you want to go read about it. Nehemiah had been, was kind of was one of those people who had, uh, a few generations back, his ancestors had been carried off to Babylon, and Nehemiah had uh, gotten himself in a position which was pretty good. He was the king's cupbearer, so it was sort of like being the king's personal assistant. And uh, one day, as Nehemiah was uh, uh, serving the king, some people from Judah came came to visit and to, and to bring news of what was happening in Judah. And they said, bad things are happening there. It's sad. The people are in disarray. They're discouraged. Um, the, you know, our worship is in disarray. We're feeling terrible there. Nehemiah was so touched by that that he wept. He wept. He said that my people where I'm from are in a terrible fix. And I feel so badly about that. I want to see if there's something I can do about it. So... I'm going to ask you right now to move with me before I tell you any more of this story to a metaphysical understanding. And in unity, this is one of our hallmarks, is that we look at the Bible on many levels. And one of those levels is metaphysically, to interpret it, to see what are the characters in this story saying to me about my inner life. So if you think about this and you think about yourself, aren't there places in us that are like what happened to the people in Judah? Places in our lives where we've gotten discouraged, where it feels like our goods gotten carried off somehow, where we feel disconnected from God, 
It may be places in our, it may be our sense of uh, self-esteem. It may be our sense of being able to express our talents. It may be worries about our relationships. It might be worries about our health. It could be a lot of different things. But can you relate that there are places in your life that feel like, I don't know, where's the good? Where's God? I'm feeling discouraged here. And yet there's this, um, we've lost our connection to God. And then there's Nehemiah in us too. There's Nehemiah that becomes aware of that, that we, become, we wake up and, and there's something that says, maybe we can go along a long time without really noticing it. You know how we do that sometimes? We can go through life and we just sort of go along to get along and we kind of just put up with it. But then the good news is that one day something in us wakes up and says, hey, wait a minute, I'm noticing here that I'm hurting. I'm noticing here that I feel disconnected from my good. And that part of us has feelings, and that's a good thing. It's waking up. Just like Nehemiah, there's something in us that that weeps, that's sad for that state of affairs in ourselves. Can you relate to this? Yeah, me, I can. So then Nehemiah did something pretty gutsy, pretty amazing. He was scared, but he did it anyway. He was the king's cupbearer, sort of like the king's personal assistant. So he goes to the king and the queen, and he says to them, he says, back home the people are in disarray, they're discouraged. He says, I want to go back and rebuild the temple because in that culture, back to kind of the, the... regular world here in that culture, the temple was the seat of worship. And if the temple was in disarray, the worship was in disarray. So he wanted to go back and rebuild the temple and invite the people to come back and make their connection with God. So Nehemiah goes to the king in fear and trembling, but he says to the king, he says, I want to go back and I want to rebuild the temple. And you know, that was risky because the king could have gotten angry about it. He could have fired him. He could have put him in jail. He could have put him to death. But that's not what the king did. It's pretty amazing. The king and the queen said, really? That's a great idea. And not only will we let you have leave to go back and do that, but we're going to make sure you have safe passage. We'll give you letters and guards to escort you back. And we're going to give you a grant to rebuild the temple. They really did. They didn't call it a grant, but that's what it was. (laughs) They gave him money to go back and rebuild the temple. In us, the king, and metaphysically, when we interpret the Bible spiritually, kings always symbolize the ruling will. They always symbolize, where is our will turning? Where is my will taking me? This is a wonderful story because Nehemiah, the compassionate part of ourselves that was waking up, went to the will, our will in ourselves, because our will is what decides, where am I going to turn my attention? Am I going to turn it to God or am I going to turn it to the outer? So the compassionate part goes to the ruling will and says, will you turn your attention to God? And the ruling will says, yes, 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 in abundance. And I'll make sure that you're safe and I'll make sure that you have all you need to rebuild or to build your connection to God. It's a beautiful story, isn't it? And that's true for us. That's all that's required of us is to say yes to let that will say, yes, even in my moment of greatest discouragement, even in my moment of greatest confusion, I will choose to, instead of just getting lost in it, I'll say, but I know God is here. I know God is in the midst of me. With our friend Betty from the Daily Word, don't worry, it's all taken care of from the start. It's all taken care of from the start. And as we turn our attention our attention to God and put our effort toward that, then we reap those beautiful rewards. The development of our spiritual life is not free. There's a paradox here. Yes, we're all innately spiritual. Yes, we're all expressions of God. Yes, it's all here. And if we want to develop it, we've got to put attention to it. It's just like a child. Do they have the innate ability to move, to walk, to talk? Yes. But we know that until that child makes the effort and until we as adults support that child in making the effort to walk and talk and feed themselves and do all that they need to do, they're not going to develop, right? And so it's the same thing. So we must also make those efforts toward God, putting our attention toward God and letting ourselves be fed. 
So this is the context in which the book of Malachi is written. Scholars don't know for sure, but they're pretty sure as much as they can tell from their studies that Malachi was a prophet during this time in Judah when Nehemiah came back to build the temple. And so Malachi as a prophet, and metaphysically what a prophet is, is that aspect within ourselves that says pay attention to God. Pay attention to God. And what else does it say? Pay attention to God, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's that aspect of ourselves that says, don't forget God, what? Don't forget God, don't forget God, right? That's what a prophet is, and so that's what Malachi was busy doing. So in that context, when Nehemiah was back and they were rebuilding the temple and reconnecting with religion, reconnecting with spiritual principles, Malachi was busy exhorting people to come back to God. And so one of the things that Malachi said was this, and this is in Malachi 3, verse 10. He said, bring the full tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. It's beautiful. What Malachi is saying is remember who you are and whose you are. You know, traditionally a tithe is the first fruits, it's the tenth that we give back to God if it's of our material possessions, and that's certainly one meaning of that. At the spiritual inner level, what the tithe is, is it again, it's the first fruits of my attention. Bring my attention fully into the consciousness of God. Bring it into connection. Bring it into the storehouse of good, into that heaven consciousness. Because when I bring it into that heaven consciousness, then there's plenty of food for me in my spiritual life. Because if we don't pay attention to the good, if we don't pay attention to our spiritual life, we're cutting it off and we're cutting off our own good. But when we bring that attention into the storehouse, the first fruits of our attention, and that can mean a lot of things. It can mean when you first wake up in the morning, think about making that conscious contact with uh, God as you understand God. It can mean when you're in, uh, taking time to develop your uh, prayer life, taking time when your thoughts are straying into negativity, is to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me turn myself to wholeness. Let me turn myself to love. Let me turn myself to peace. Let me turn myself to faith and to trust. And that's bringing those first fruits. And when we do that, the windows of heaven, the windows of consciousness, heaven consciousness is that uranos, expansion. Is the, uh, the Greek word is uranos, I mean, and that's where heaven comes from in, in English, is that expansive consciousness, that place from which all life generates, so that those windows open in our consciousness and we have access to all good. We have access to expansive good. So how do we get in partnership with God? Just say yes. Let's pray. Mother, Father, God, we're grateful today for that your power in us that does indeed open those windows of heaven. And so we're ready to do that. We say yes to that. We partner with you and we open to good. And so it is. And we affirm this in the name and through the power of the loving, living Christ. Amen. Amen. Amazing grace. How That saved a soul like me. I once was lost, but now am found. That grace my fears. Hurt.
to who 